phone rang three more times as we sat across the desk in my office, trying to figure out what to do. I didn't answer because I assumed it was the Orlando Police Department calling back, and I wasn't ready to talk to them. I knew I'd have to eventually, but for now, we decided to see if we could pry the son of a bitch out of the woodwork. I didn't like the idea of using her as bait, but I couldn't see any other option. We didn't have enough information, and I doubted the Orlando police had any idea what was going on here in Detroit. From the brief conversation I had with Detective Sanchez, it sounded like the investigation into Bethany Keene's death had just begun, and they hadn't put the Bethany, Lucy, Carla pieces together yet. There would be time to compare notes, but for now, we didn't have any notes to compare. I drove to Carla's place along a different route than she was traveling, but kept in contact by cell phone to make sure we'd arrive at the same time. I needed my approach to go unseen and had to get into her house without anyone knowing I'd be there with her. The idea was to make it look like she'd be home alone. That meant I had to park on another block and make my way in from the rear. I'd started to formulate a plan, but didn't put it all together until I noted the recycling bins sitting at the curb. Carla had a vague idea of what we were doing, but I thought it best to leave the details for the last minute. Carla's a talker. I'm a doer. Putting a talker and a doer together with hours to ponder the particulars would only ensure an ass-chapping recipe for a really unpleasant night. Okay, Morno, I'm pulling in the driveway now. I don't think he'll approach you in daylight with that many houses around and you talking on the phone. I suspect that's why he hasn't had a chance to grab you, yet. You haven't been there enough in the past few days, and the one or two chances he had were brief and probably not under optimum conditions. Could you please stop with the optimum conditions bullshit? I feel like I'm going to puke. Where are you? I'm just about to get out of the car. I had already parked two streets over and was making my way through neighboring yards to the rear of her house. I hunkered behind an eight-foot privacy fence. I'm in your rear neighbor's backyard looking through a hole in the fence. I don't see anyone. Go in. Lock the door behind you. Then go straight to the back door and unlock it so I can get in. I heard her car door slam. She spoke quietly into the phone. I'm walking up to the door. Fuck, Morno, what if he's inside? If all the windows and doors were locked when you left the last time, I don't think he could get in. You sure you did? Yes, I'm sure. Get to the back door and open it. I'm right here. Walking through the house, just past the kitchen, almost there. Okay, it's unlocked. From my vantage point, I could see the back door open about an inch as she said, Where are you? Close the door, Carla. I don't want anyone to see you looking for anything. Wait right there. I'm coming across the yard. I took one more scan through an open knot hole in the fence to make sure I didn't see anyone lurking around. Then I bolted across the yard and entered the back door. Carla squealed as the door opened into her. Relax, I said, shutting and locking the door behind me. Did you lock the front door? Carla nodded and followed me around the house while I checked all the windows and made sure no one was in the house with us. Close the curtains, I told her as I began opening cupboards in the kitchen. And please tell me you have something to drink in this place. Carla slid the drapes along the front window, effectively cutting off any view from the outside. Oh, great. You want to get drunk while we wait for my stalker to arrive? No, I just want to relax a little while we wait. I don't see him coming until after sundown. She entered the kitchen and opened a cabinet under the sink, pulling out a bottle of Johnny Walker. And handing it to me. I figured I'd be entertaining you here at some point. But I am begging you, Morno, please. You cannot be passed out when whoever this schmuck is decides it's time to fucking play. Carla, enough. It came out more gruffly than intended. I get it. 
She pulled a glass out of the cabinet and I motioned for her to grab another. Then I poured two drinks and handed her one. Drink it. You're at about ten right now and I need you hovering somewhere around five if you want me to stay here. She glared at me over the edge of the glass then squeezed her eyes together and swallowed. God, that's vile. I emptied my glass and poured another while she watched me with a mild look of disdain on her face. Good. A healthy dose of apprehension and scorn where I'm concerned will serve you well. I took the glass and bottle into the living room and sat on the couch. It'll serve you well, you mean. Pardon me? She watched me drink my third drink, then snatched the bottle away and sat on the other end of the couch, holding it in her lap. You're afraid of me, Morno. Just admit it. Yes, Carla. That must be it. That's going to get old pretty quick. My dad made me that clock. She leaned back and then tucked a finger behind the seam of the drapes, peering outside. Don't do that. We can't let him know that we know he's out there. We don't even know if he's out there, Morno. She let go of the curtain and looked at me. We don't know anything except we're stuck in here waiting until God knows when. How long are we supposed to sit here? However long it takes. I reached for the bottle. She shook her head. Give it to me, Carla. She grudgingly handed it over. I poured a liberal amount into my glass and handed it back to her. She disappeared down the hall. Presumably, to stash it somewhere, I wouldn't be able to find it. I reached around to the small of my back and removed the gun from where it was tucked into the waistband of my jeans under my shirt. I set it on the coffee table. When Carla came back into the room, she stopped short, staring at it. Jesus, Morno. What? You thought we'd take the guy on with your egg beater? Whip him into submission? Or maybe yank your chicken clock off the wall and hurl it at his head? She eyed the gun uncomfortably as she stepped over my feet and sat next to me on the couch, swiveling around to lay down with her head in my lap. I don't think that's a good idea, I said, looking down at her. Yeah, well, none of this is a good idea. So you play sentry, I'm taking a nap. She propped her legs up on the end of the couch and closed her eyes. I haven't gotten much sleep lately. Aside from the discomfort of her general proximity, Carla sleeping for a while was a good idea. We couldn't do anything until after dark, when the streets outside quieted enough to make any possible intruder emerge from the safety of the shadows. Time unraveled slowly, unnervingly. With her head in my lap and the sound of the cuckoo clock crowing away the next couple of hours, I tried to work the puzzle with what little I knew, to fashion some kind of picture that made sense. There were too many missing pieces. I couldn't figure out why her husband would be coming back now. It didn't make sense. Even Carla admitted he had nothing to avenge. If he was safely out of the country, he'd be stupid to make any move that would leave a trail leading back to him. Unless there was something else he wanted. Or needed. If that was the case, it made sense that he hadn't approached her until now. If she left Florida only six months after the murders occurred, not enough time had elapsed prior to that to allow him to make a move. The case was still open. Leads were being tracked down. And there were too many eyes on her for him to do anything without drawing attention to himself. He'd have waited for the storm to die down, for people to forget the images peppering the evening news for weeks and months, bodies on stretchers being removed from a suburban house, candlelight vigils, press conferences. When a pretty young member of a seemingly safe community suddenly becomes the victim of a crime like that, he gets a lot of airtime. The neighborhood watch instantly becomes a fully functioning force. Police release leads little by little in an effort to cast the net in wider increments. Nancy Grace begins frothing at the mouth every night for months on end, as posters are taped to every local storefront window. But once the leads dried up and Lucy Rios disappeared, until I made the call to Bethany Keene, Carla Danning 
had been relatively safe. Going over and over it had done nothing but provide a temporary distraction from the sound of her breaths, slowing to a soft whisper, and the occasional mewing noises she made as she unconsciously tucked herself into a solace that only sleep can provide. I was just thinking I needed another drink when her eyes opened abruptly and she looked at me. Hey. I waited for her to emerge from the purgatory that lies between sleep and wake, where nothing on either side makes sense. Mm. She sat up, took a deep breath, then nestled into me, putting her head against my shoulder and tucking her legs under her. All this touchy-feely stuff had a way of causing my mood to deteriorate rapidly. I didn't like it, wasn't accustomed to it, and never knew exactly how to handle myself within the confines of the role. Glad you're up. I'd like to stretch my legs, pee, get another drink. Your bedside manner leaves a hell of a lot to be desired, you know that? Maybe because we're on a couch. You are not sick. And I'm the last person who will be tending to you, should you ever become so. I'm not expecting anything from you, Morneau. I thought we got past all that. Then maybe we need to establish the use of that 12 inches of personal space rule I remember you mentioning. When her face fell with the memory of Barney, I felt like shit. The landmines I was juggling kept distracting me from the ones I was trying to step around. Carla slid away from me on the couch, raking her fingers through her hair. I'm gonna go pee and when I get back, I'd like a drink. I headed for the safety of the bathroom. After taking care of my reason for being there in the first place, I spent an inordinate amount of time washing my hands and staring at the stranger in the mirror. When I got back to the living room, the bottle sat on the coffee table next to a glass already filled half full. Carla was crouched by the window, trying to get a glimpse of whatever was outside through the thin slit between the two curtain panels. Away from the window, I muttered as I grabbed the drink and sat down. What is bugging you? She moved away from the window and sat back down on the couch. I could have told her what was bugging me was what we were about to do, and how I wasn't sure it would work, or worse, it would work. I could have told her that since she'd sauntered into my life, I'd spent the subsequent months in a constant state of exasperation and invigoration in equal measure with intermittent bouts of excruciating pain and an unbearable lightness of being. I could have told her I suddenly felt more awake than I cared to feel, and that feeling was a luxury neither of us could afford. I could have told her all or any part of that. Instead, I said, What's bugging me is you touching me all the time. What's bugging me is having an assistant that brought a shitload of trouble into my life and now I'm sitting in her house waiting for her maniac husband or whoever he sent to come unload that steaming pile at my feet when I could be at the meanwhile right now having a steak and watching mugs wash glasses behind the bar. The thing about Carla is she takes stuff like that and turns it inside out. Instead of getting hurt, she distills what comes out of my mouth into her preferred meaning and then performs a series of stealthy maneuvers that catch me off guard every goddamn time. She watched me toss back the drink then took the glass out of my hand, set it on the table, and climbed on my lap, wincing slightly as she bent her bad knee and tucked each leg astride my hips. Morno, if I hadn't come into your life when I did, you'd have crawled down the neck of that bottle and been treading water by now. She put her hand on either side of my face and touched her nose to mine. According to your muddled metaphor, I'd be treading scotch, not water. And I'm more of a relaxed backstroke kind of guy. I turned my face away from hers. Ah, right. There's nothing relaxed about you. You're an overstretched rubber band threatening to snap at any second. I grabbed her wrists and removed them from my face. Carla... Are you ready to do this? Mm, yes, please. I took her shoulders and pushed her away. It's almost dark. 
I've got a plan to lure this guy in, and it involves some risk on your part, so we need to discuss it. She chewed on her bottom lip for a few seconds. I assume since we're locked in here, that means I'm going to have to go outside to accomplish that goal? I nodded. And until we do whatever it is that you want me to do, we're safe in here, right? I nodded again. Good. Quid pro quo, detective. But this time, we're not playing with salient life details. You want me to be the bait? You're going to have to catch me first. She wrapped her arms around me, tucked her head into the crook of my neck, and whispered against my earlobe. In the event things go horribly awry later, consider this my final request. There is very good reason why prize fighters and all manner of sportsmen refrain from activities of the flesh prior to any kind of engagement. It's not just that the body has been depleted of such things as fluids, electrolytes, and the will to do anything other than sleep for a dozen hours. It is also because any emotional entanglement that inevitably accompanies such carnal activities is harder to disengage than appendages from orifices. I tried not to watch Carla as we retrieved the clothing that had been discarded in a manner I personally felt was conduct unbecoming to grown adults. I tugged her shirt down from the ceiling fan and tossed it to her, not meeting her gaze. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to keep this guy from killing you. Geez, Morno, you've got the foreplay thing down, Pat, but your post-coital wrap-up needs a little bit of work. Carla pulled my jeans off the top of the television and slung them at me. Keep screwing around. I'll have you out of my hair sooner rather than later. Don't be such a grump. You just got your knob waxed. Most guys would be less cranky. I yanked on my shirt. Most guys aren't about to dispense of a stalker of unknown origin, Carla. Have you forgotten why I'm here? No, actually, I have not forgotten. She tugged her shirt over her head, then planted her hands on her still bare hips. I was simply trying to smooth an abrupt segue. You'll have to forgive me if I require a second or two between orgasm and crime fighting. And what do you mean by possibly dispensing? I picked the gun up off the coffee table. If I'm forced to use this... There's a good chance there will be a dead person on your property before the night is over. Are you prepared for that possibility? Yes, Morno. I understand the implications. Stop talking to me like I'm a second grader with a learning disability. Just tell me what I have to do. Fine. Fine. Carla? Carla? I'm serious. I'm serious. I sat down on the couch and grabbed the glass, poured some scotch, and tossed it back. She stared at me defiantly as she grabbed the bottle from my hands and took a swig, then put it down with a jarring thunk. Okay, we're serious, we're liquid, and we're ready to fucking rumble. Tell me what I need to do. My irritated growl was countered with an amused grin. I saw the recycling bins on the curb at some of the neighbors. They come tomorrow? Yep. And yours isn't out yet. That'll be our excuse to get you outside. What do you usually wear to bed? You saw it a few minutes ago, Detective. Do you have anything that you could walk outside in that looks like sleepwear? I asked, blatantly ignoring the implication of her last statement. She nodded and disappeared into her room. A couple minutes later, she came back wearing a sleeveless cotton nightgown that hung to mid-thigh. Is this okay? I nodded. Do you have anything in your recycle bin right now? I followed her into the kitchen. She opened the door leading to the garage and pulled the bin into the kitchen. All right, good. Take four or five of those cans and bottles out. We're going to need them. She removed a few cans and one empty milk container, setting them on the kitchen table. Where's your cell phone? I asked, holding the bin as she went into the living room to retrieve the phone from her purse. When she returned, I asked... 
can you carry this bin and the cell phone at the same time? With the cell phone in one hand, she grabbed the bin by the edge farthest from her with her free hand, tucking against her hip. Okay, I got it. All right, the idea is, you're taking out the recycling bin through the garage while chatting on the phone. You're wearing your nightgown, so it looks like you're in for the evening. We want him to know you're here and getting ready for bed. I'll be watching at the front window in case he does pop out from somewhere. But I doubt he'll approach you while you're on the phone. Yeah, well, it's that pesky doubt part that concerns me. I'll be right there by the door with my gun. If he does jump out, I'll be there. I don't think he'd try to stab or shoot you on the front lawn so close to neighboring houses. He'll want you inside. The closer you get to the house after dropping off the bin is where the danger will be. That's where he'll try and grab you. Or he's waiting until all the lights go out and he'll try to get in then. Leave the garage door open and this adjoining kitchen door unlocked when you come back in. He won't know it's unlocked, but with that garage door wide open like that, I'm guessing it's the first point of entry he'll try. Carla nodded throughout my instructions, trying to assimilate it all. You need to look engrossed in your call. Engrossed enough that leaving the garage open looks inadvertent. Do you understand? I took drama in high school. I can handle that part. If I don't piss myself on the way back up to the house, since apparently that's when you think he might grab me. Just move fast and talk loud. That's not exactly a stretch for you. Once you get back in, I'm going to set these cans and this milk container up against the door. So if he does come through here, we're hearing. Then we wait. Carla shuddered. You okay with this? Yeah, I can do it. She said less confidently than I was comfortable with. You sure? Yes, let's do it, Morneau. I have to pee. Well, go pee. No, it'll add to the authenticity of my performance. She impatiently motioned for me to open the door. I put my hand on the knob. As soon as you exit this door, I'll run straight to the front window. I'll be watching the whole time. When I open the door, you hit the garage door opener with the hand, holding the cell phone so you don't have to put the bin down. I don't want you fumbling around in there once that garage door starts opening. Just relax, Morneau. You're making me more nervous. I've got this. Now open the door and man your fucking station, because if this guy jumps out at me and you don't come to my rescue, you better fucking hope he kills me. I nodded as I opened the door. When her hand went up to hit the garage door button, I sprinted across the kitchen and through the living room. I stood with my back flat against the wall, peering through the small opening between the window and the curtain. I could hear the garage door trundling open, and only a few seconds passed before she emerged into view and headed down the driveway. I couldn't hear what she was saying, but she looked like she was having a spirited conversation on the phone. When she got to the end of the driveway, she dropped the bin at the curb by the base of her mailbox and turned to head back toward the house, still yelling something into the phone and gesticulating madly. I couldn't see anyone lurking anywhere or any cars parked along the street, immediately in front of the house. Though my view was obstructed by trees on one side, and the part of the garage that jutted out a few feet further than the facade of the house on the other. Then I heard her voice nearing. No, Morno, I told you it's absolutely okay to have sex with your doppelganger. Of course it doesn't mean you're gay, it just means you're a narcissist. When I heard the door in the kitchen close, I hurried in there. Her forehead was shiny with what had to be an instant nervous flop sweat. She snapped the cell phone closed. How'd I do? Perfect, I said, rolling my eyes. After I set the cans up against the door leading to the garage, I flipped off the kitchen light, then motioned for her to do the same thing in the living room. Then I pulled her into the hallway and whispered into her ear. Go around the house and turn off all the lights. I'm going to sit up in the kitchen, so I'll be behind the door if he opens it. Criminals are predictable if you go through the process of thinking things through from their perspective. In this case, I knew there was only one way into the house, unless he broke a window or picked a lock. There were three windows in the house, one in the bedroom and two in the living room. Two doors with dead bolts and chains, the front and the back, made getting into those almost impossible without alerting me first. Where do you want me to go? In bed, where he'd expect you to be. If you hear anything at your window, get on the floor and crawl in here. Your curtains are closed in the bedroom, right? 
She nodded and leaned around to make sure. I'll be in the kitchen where I can see into the living room and watch the door. So you're going to stand in the kitchen all night? If that's what it takes. I nudged her toward the bedroom. I watched her get into bed and shut the light. Then I went down the small hallway to make sure the back door was locked and bolted. After doing the same to the front door, I went into the kitchen to stand by the door that led to the garage where I could see into the living room. I had a corner to lean against, but it was going to be a long, uncomfortable night. I checked again to make sure the door was unlocked, then pulled my cell phone out of my pocket and put it on vibrate. Not two minutes later, I heard Carla get up and pad to the bathroom. The toilet flushed soon after, followed by the sounds of her getting back into bed. Standing in one place for any length of time has never been my strong suit. Holding a gun in one hand while my injured hand throbbed if I left it hanging down at my side for any length of time, and listening to the sound of silence for hours, I started to relish every cackle of the cuckoo clock. It was like waiting for a tornado you know is headed your way. You're directly in its path. You've taken every precaution you can think of. And then it becomes a waiting game. Every sense becomes unnervingly hyper-vigilant. Every muscle taut and ready to spring into action. You wonder if it'll pass right over or veer in another direction. Will it miss you altogether? You start to contemplate the damage that'll be left in its wake because presupposition is all you have left. That and the knowledge that if everything goes as you think it will, it'll end badly for someone, even if that someone isn't you. In this case, if our plan was successful, it would only lead to more questions. If it failed, it wouldn't matter anyway. 